my own son in the faith. Then pay attention to the next part. Grace, mercy, and peace. From God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. How many of you this afternoon, if I was to ask you the question, do you ever feel like you have more to do than you have energy? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Roy chimes in with yes. Well, that's a common problem in our society today. People live fast-paced lives and a lot of things going on. Maybe things seem to pile on you. Anybody feel like things pile on you from time to time? And oftentimes that's when you're the most tired. Karen, does that make sense? Absolutely. Amen. Well, if that's the way you feel, I've got good news. Like our old professor used to say in Bible college, we'd start chapel services, he'd say, good news, good news, and more good news. And then he'd tar look at the scriptures. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2, the verse we just read, Paul said to Timothy, My own son in the faith, our faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord and, uh, and Jesus Christ our Lord. In this verse, we see those three important words Paul uses to encourage young Timothy. And as we look at that, let's look at that today and see what that means as we look at the fact that God can extend to us special mercy, special grace, and He can also give us peace when nothing else can. It's available for the asking. What does that mean, David? This David. It's available for the asking. What does that mean to you? Amen. That's true. So what we'll learn this afternoon is exactly what we need so that if you're in that place that we started out with where you're feeling like you've got stuff piling on and you've got more to do than you have energy, we're going to learn this afternoon how we can deal with that and be successful. In all of Paul's epistles, he greets the person or the recipients of his letters with two special words. He uses the words grace and peace. The wording may differ a little bit between the epistles, but the words are always present. And let's, check, let's just check that out make sure I'm telling you the truth. You're in 1 Timothy. Go to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. We'll look at a couple of these things that Paul wrote. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, that's us, grace to you and Peace, the Bible says, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Stay with me. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3. The Bible says, Grace be unto you and peace. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he began with that. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 2. The, the Bible says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord, or from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we won't go looking at all of these for the sake of time, but if we were to look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse 3, you'd find the same words, grace and peace. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 2, grace and peace. Philippians 1 verse 2, grace and peace. Colossians, grace and peace. Thessalonians, both first and second, grace and peace. And you'd also find it in first, uh, Philemon first, uh, verse one, uh, chapter 1 verse 3. So why did Paul always use these words in his greetings in each of these letters that he wrote to people? Here's why. Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. And because of that, Paul had to be in touch with some of those folks that would read his letters that were of Greek customs. In ancient Greece, people had a habit of greeting each other with a custom. Instead of saying hello, like we do, Greek, uh, Greek people would in the ancient days would say grace. So if I was going to walk up to Michelle and give her the greeting of the day, I would instead of saying hello, Michelle, I would say Grace, Michelle. And you would in turn say, Grace, Amen. 
See, so Paul put these things in his letters for the purpose of trying to uh, appeal to the customs of the day and the culture of the day. And can I tell you this afternoon, we still have to take that into consideration even to this day. Now, have I told you before that people in the South are different than people in the North? <laughs> they are. Uh, people out in the western part of the country where Brother Nathaniel pastors the church in Burns, Wyoming, they're different than both the Northeasterners and the Southeasterners. Uh, if you go all the way out to the West Coast, guess what? People at my daughter's church in the, in the Seattle area, they're different. People are different, and they don't always acknowledge the same things. And so Paul, when he was writing his letters, Paul used the Greek word charis, which basically is the same word for English grace. And so translated into our English word, it carries the same idea. When you hear somebody say grace, well, this word, if you look it up and you study the word out, you're going to find two things. This word that Paul used, the word charis, carries with it the thought of both grace and favor. So if I was to go to Michelle again and I would say to Michelle, I would say grace, grace and favor, Michelle. And she would say grace and favor to me. And so Paul had a reason for what he wrote. Remember, he was under the inspiration of the word of, of, of God's spirit. And so certainly it was carrying him to do what he did. And we don't want to equate too much to Paul. But yet God used what he knew to be uh, favorable and, ac and accurate in the day that Paul was witnessing. It was like saying to someone, I greet you with grace and favor. And because Paul was trying to reach Gentile Greeks and bring them to Christ, it makes perfect sense to use the common language of the day. And so Paul was not only encountering Greeks, guess what else? He was also meeting many Jews. And so when we find the word, uh, the, the word grace appropriate for Greeks, guess what word is appropriate for Jews? Peace. Or in other words, Shalom. And so Paul wrote those words into it because by using both of these two words, Paul was appealing to both Greeks and to Jews, which was the, the, the larger part of society of the day where he was working. It was a brilliant way to accommodate both cultures. And so one scholar said this, he said, by using these two words, Paul was throwing the doors wide open to the gospel for anyone who would read his epistles. And when Paul wrote the books of 1st and 2nd Timothy uh, and, and the book of Titus, he did something a bit different. And that's what we're going to look at here now. Go over to 1st uh, Timothy again. 1st Timothy chapter number 1. Notice verse 2. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. Look what he says. He says, grace... But then he inserts the word mercy between those two words. He says grace, mercy, and peace. And so you ask yourself, the reason was that in these three letters, Paul did the same thing in the book of 1 Timothy. He did it in 2 Timothy, and he also did it in the book of Titus. In all three of those books, instead of saying just grace and peace, he also included the word mercy. And the reason that these three letters were different was because in these three letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, Paul was writing to young pastors. He was writing to young pastors. Timothy was his own son in the faith. We know that Paul was instrumental in bringing Timothy to Christ and uh, using him in, in the ministry. And these letters were more private in nature, not really designed to be read by the public, uh, the public at large at that time. But in both cases, Timothy and Titus Here's what was going on. They were both feeling very overwhelmed. Remember I asked you at the beginning of the lesson this afternoon, do you feel overwhelmed at times with all the things that you have to deal with? Well, that was where we find both Timothy and Titus. In both cases, Timothy and Titus were feeling overwhelmed. Here's why. In Timothy's church, and this is going to seem really strange to you, Timothy's church was feeling overwhelmed, or excuse me, Timothy was feeling overwhelmed because his church that he was pastoring he, it was the largest congregation in that time. It was a, it was a large, fast-growing church. Uh, the congregation was sweat, literally swelling with all kinds of new people coming. Uh, it was just growing by leaps and bounds. And Timothy was the one that was placed in charge of that congregation 
And Paul had left him there to sort of pastor the church. And he was overwhelmed. And that's why he sought Paul's advice on how to choose leaders. How do you choose leaders? Paul reminded him that there was very special mercy available to Timothy in pastoring the church and doing what needed to be done. We also know that several years after Paul wrote the first letter, the climate in Timothy's church changed drastically. We know this because he, he had the task of pastoring the largest church in the area at that time. And uh, after the first letter had gone out and things had been going really, really well, guess what happened? All of a sudden, the church started to experience a lot of problems. And as fast as the church grew at one end of town, the church started to decline later on very quickly. As a matter of fact, the church grew so fast that Timothy could not keep up. So he was scrambling, looking for leaders to help him in the ministry. And then all of a sudden, it took the exact 180 turn and started to decline as fast as it had grown. It was now in decline. And Timothy was faced with the thought of watching all of the things that the Lord had done in people's lives all of a sudden seemingly come crashing down. So Timothy was overwhelmed. His church was in serious decline. Timothy was now watching leaders and core people leaving who he thought would never leave. He thought they would be faithful to the end and that they'd never leave. But now all of a sudden, Timothy's pastoring a bunch of people who decided they're leaving for all kinds of reasons. The most prominent reason was of persecution. There was so much persecution in that area where Timothy was pastoring later in the ministry that people were leaving because they were afraid of the persecution. People were being killed and people were being persecuted to the very serious nature because they were Christians. And so Timothy was trying his best to keep the whole thing together. And so consequently, he was, he was in, in, a, in a dire strait. In 2 Timothy, we find the, the same encouragement Timothy needed. Look at 2 Timothy. Look at verse number 2. Paul says this to Timothy, but notice the difference in the wording, my beloved son, or my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus the Lord. Paul was doing his best to encourage young Timothy because of what he knew Timothy was going through. And notice how he says, my beloved son. You know, that son's it's kind of like a term of endearment, if you will. He wanted Timothy to know that he loved him and that he cared for him and he cared about what he was going through. The third time Paul inserts this word mercy was in the book of Titus. Go over to Titus. Titus. Look at um, verse number one. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God, to Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. In this book, in, in, the, in the book of Titus, Paul had started the church on the island of Crete. And when he planted the church there, helped to establish the church there, it was in the very infancy stages of organization and people coming. And, and when Paul had to leave Crete to go on to the next place, he left Titus in charge, but he left Titus in a, in a place that really wasn't quite completely organized yet. Still needed a lot of things that needed to be done. So he put uh, Titus in charge of that. And Titus found out very quickly the people of Crete had a history of being lazy gluttons. Do you all know anybody who's a lazy glutton? They're in every crowd. Amen. But the people of Crete had a history of being lazy and gluttonous. And, and here's the third thing. They also had a history of being liars. And that was the place that Titus found himself in. Paul had given him the responsibility of the church on Crete. 
And Titus was there, and he found out that they were lazy, gluttonous liars that he was now pastoring. They were devious, mischievous people who were very difficult to trust. Y'all ever met anybody like that? They're everywhere. Society is full of folks like that today. All they want is what they can get for themselves. Even more, Crete was known to be a repository, and to get this, of criminals and barbaric people. So that was who Titus was charged to pastor. So when you, when you know some of the history behind these books, okay, it changes the book to some extent. Because now it makes more sense of some of the things that Paul says. When you know some of the history surrounding the churches that these men were pastoring, it gives you a little bit more flavor for why Paul said the things that he said. Even more, they were uh, because Crete was a repository for criminals and barbaric-like people, uh, it was a tough crowd to say the least. And Paul wrote to Titus and he told him, notice he says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. I can imagine Titus probably thinking to himself, don't do me any favors. Amen? Sometimes in the ministry, sometimes you find yourself in your own mind's eye, not publicly saying it, but mind's eye, you say, well, geez, what in the world? What comes next? You know, we just went through this. What in the world is going to come next? So Paul says this, for this cause I left thee in Crete that thou shouldest, look what he says, set in order the things that are wanting. In other words, Paul said to Titus, I've left you here for the purpose of getting that crowd straightened out. That's in common language. Get in there, set things in order, and let's get some things straightened out that need to be straightened out. And Paul put Titus there. So now do you understand a little bit more why it is that Titus needed mercy? Huh? Why he needed God's mercy? This would have been a monstrous task for even the most seasoned leader. And it loomed here before Titus as a huge assignment. The circumstances Titus faced were so immense that when Paul wrote to him, he said to Titus, Mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace. It wasn't enough for Titus to hear about grace and peace. He also needed to be reminded that there was a special mercy available to him for his situation. And can I tell you this afternoon, it's true for us as well. No matter what we go through, no matter what task is assigned to us, we have the ability as God's kids to summon the same grace, the same peace, and the same mercy that Paul spoke to these folks about. In all three of these cases, the readers were... The, 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 uh, the readers were facing serious situations and needed to be reminded that God is merciful. Did you know that God is never going to pile on you just because He can? We don't serve that kind of God. Uh, God is equitable. He is, he is merciful. He is God. He is just. All those words that describe the God of the Bible, uh, that means this, that God's never going to pile on you just because He can just to make our lives miserable. But you know, that's not true of everybody. Some people set out to make your life, my life, miserable just because they can. But that's not the God that we serve. So we can take great confidence in knowing this, that when we go through a lot of things in life and it seems like things are piling on, we have the help that we need available to us for the asking. Just like what Brother David said, all you got to do is ask. And God is rich in mercy and grace, and He will give us the peace that we need. You know, we need to be reminded of many things often because we're forgetful hearers. We can hear something and we think, oh, well, I'll never forget that. We walk out the door and two days later we don't even remember what we heard. Amen? Amen? We get distracted and our minds are always working. And if you're facing a situation that would normally be devastating or overwhelming to you, grab a hold of this good news that I've just shared with you this afternoon. God has made a special measure of his mercy available to you and to me. All we have to do is ask for it.
Don't try to face... See, our problem as Christians is this. Because we're Christian, we know that, but we're also human. Amen? And we still carry around the old flesh. You know what the old flesh says? I can handle it. But the truth is, I said to you that God's never going to pile on us just because He can, but God allows things to come into our life because He wants to strengthen us and test us and a lot of things, but He's never going to do it just for the sport of it. There's always a purpose behind it. And one of the main purposes is when God sends us a big thing in our life, here's what He's looking for. Help! Amen? He wants us to ask for help. And His mercy is available as long as we ask. And if we'll open our hearts and receive from God, He will tuck a special measure of mercy between the grace and the peace that He's offering us today. Just like He did for Titus, just like He did for Timothy, and just like He's done for many others throughout the Word of God, He wants us to have grace. He wants us to have peace. And He wants to give us special mercy when we need that as well. Because you know, sometimes when we cry out, we say, help! Sometimes God knows from that word that we say, help! He might have to dial things back just a little bit. Because He sees that we're not handling it, not going to handle it. And His word is always true. His measure is always exact. He knows exactly what we can handle. He knows how long we can handle something. And He's looking for us to cry out and say, Help! And that's what we need to do. So when Titus and Timothy were going through the struggles that they were facing as young pastors, pastoring people who were very difficult for various reasons, he, Paul knew what these pastors needed was not so much more strength than in and of themselves, what they needed was to be re-encouraged to continue to seek God's help for everything that they did. We can do whatever God puts before us to do because if He puts it before us, He knows we can do it. And that means we got to trust Him and we got to be willing to ask Him for the strength and the things that we need in order to accomplish the tasks that He gives to us. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.